which is so different than like, you know, violin or piano that has hundreds of years of people being like, you know what works? This. <laughs> so, I and I think the banjo, I hope will will get there, but it's a it's it's a complicated thing because the instrument is is just so much less linear. It's really good at being a banjo and pretty bad at other things. Hello, banjo people. This is your fellow banjo person, Keith Billick, here with the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Thank you all for joining me. You're all very special to me, but I have to admit, I do have a favorite listener right now, and his name is Leonard Leedy. And the reason Leonard Leedy is so special to me right now is because he chose to be a supporter of the podcast. He went to patreon.com slash banjo podcast and donated money to keep this whole thing running. And I really do appreciate his support. You can support the podcast too by going to that Patreon page. And if you don't care to do that, that's fine too. I still am really happy that you're listening. And also for those of you who are just spreading the word about the podcast, that's some of the best promotion I can possibly get. And I really thank you for that. I also appreciate all of you who have taken the time to email me your thoughts and suggestions and comments about the podcast. Most of them have been, I'll I'll just go ahead and say all of them have been pretty positive about the podcast. But even if you have a, a complaint, if you think something is really awful, feel free to let me know. I'm a banjo player. I have thick skin. I can take that kind of thing. It's all good. Whatever your thoughts are on the podcast, you can express those to me using the email address pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com, and I look forward to hearing from you that way. Today's guest on the podcast is a guy named Wes Corbett, and Wes is a really amazing dude, a really amazing banjo player. He is, in my mind, really advancing and redefining what it means to be a modern banjo player. And what I mean by that is he just tends to have a very broad range of skills on the banjo that he's worked really hard to cultivate and also having a lot of outside influences, even apart from what we would consider the banjo universe, and manages to just filter those all through his banjo and his music. And it really comes out as a very impressive display of skills and musicianship. So I'm really excited to have you hear what he's all about and hear some of his music. Wes gained notoriety by playing with a band called Joy Kills Sorrow, and we actually didn't end up discussing that band very much on this podcast, so I at least wanted to point that out, that he was part of that band, and they had a few really great recordings. Now he plays with the Molly Tuttle Band. Molly is an award-winning guitar player, so that's a really impressive group to see him with as well. And also, he has a project with a hammered dulcimer player named Simon Chrisman, and you'll get to hear him talk quite a bit about um, his relationship with Simon and the music that they're doing. Um, Something that impressed me talking to Wes is how seriously he takes all aspects of his craft. He's obviously very serious about playing. He's literally been working at it his entire life, as you'll hear him uh, talking about. He's really serious about the sound that he gets out of his banjo. He's really serious about producing records. He's really serious about teaching. He taught at the Berklee College of Music for several years, so... There's a there's a focus with him that I think really comes out in his playing. So I had a great time chatting with him about all aspects. I feel like I could have picked his brain for quite a bit longer about his different influences and his approach to all of this musical stuff that is going on in his head. There is something else about this podcast that I'm noticing while editing it that I hesitate to point out, but I'll just go ahead and come clean with it. I'm really into what Wes is talking about, but you know who I'm not into? It's me. There just seem to be certain points in the interview where I come across as having not too much enthusiasm or energy, and I just don't want uh, people to take that the wrong way as if I'm uh, disinterested in what Wes was saying. I'm actually a a big fan of his playing, so nothing could be further from the truth. So I'm going to chalk it up to this was at banjo camp, and maybe I was tired or something like that. So that's my excuse. I hope it doesn't bother you too much. And the last thing to mention here before we get started, I'm actually going to let you behind the scenes here of the Picky Fingers Banjo podcast. Um, When I'm setting up for these interviews with these players, there's always a process of getting the microphone set up, getting the levels checked, getting the recording equipment started, all that kind of stuff. And then as soon as I'm ready, you know, I I give some sort of signal like, okay, we're rolling, we're starting now. Uh, With this, I, I started the recorder as I was setting up the microphones, and you can hear 
Wes discussed the proper microphone placement for his banjo, and I just thought it was interesting, or at least I like hearing that kind of stuff from banjo players. So I I included sort of the pre-interview footage that I have. You'll hear me placing the microphone. It's not necessarily the most interesting thing to listen to if you're not into that. But I am, so here you go. Enjoy the podcast with Wes Corbett. Usually this side of the banjo sounds better. I don't know how geeky you want to get about this, but... If, if you know that, then I will uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, like so... between the bridge and the tailpiece? Or even kind of more... So, like... Uh, a lot of the time, it's here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where I usually go for but it. But this banjo likes something a little higher, but okay. it definitely should be parallel with the head is one thing yeah, that Cinco is always like. Yeah, you hear that? <laughs> it's popped into... Yep. Much more. Wow, yeah. That's great. So much more like prismatic. Um, and that's unique to your banjo you've found? or this, this instrument, yeah, really likes to be mic'd up there, which is kind of funny. I mean, um, and it's funny because, like, basically my hand is, like... It doesn't in, make sense. ...in between, be but it, it doesn't... It really doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yeah, cool. Um, Okay. Ready? Yeah. Cool. We're rolling. Hey, Wes, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. So I don't don't know you personally too well, but it's nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to Uh, meet you. Tell me where you're from and how you got into the banjo. Yeah, so I'm originally from a little island across the water from Seattle called Bainbridge Island. Okay. And I was super privileged uh, and lucky enough that when my parents realized that I was musical, they started me on classical piano when I was two and a half. They realized you were musical at age of two. <laughs> my mom always joked and said that, uh, that I came out of the womb humming. Wow. <laughs> uh, and my grandfather on my mom's side uh, was a conductor and classical pianist and trumpet, uh, trumpetist, <laughs> trumpet player. Um, and so I think they also helped out my folks in those early years. You had a lot of embryonic vibrations yeah, happening totally. from, from outside. Well, my mom was a professional modern dancer too, so there was a lot of, a lot of music going on. A lot of arts. A lot of arts, influenced. yeah. And my dad was a professional potter. <laughs> so Yeah, that's artsy incredible. Artsy family. Um, so they started you on classical piano, you said? Yeah, Suzuki classical piano. Did you get pretty serious about that, stick with it? I stuck with it, uh, like, only because my mom, uh, which I'm now so thankful for, would just, like, made me stick with it until I heard the banjo. Yeah. And then the, she lost the well, that's the That's the oldest story in the book, right? <laughs> the, the someday you'll thank me for making you take piano No, it's lessons. totally true. Yeah. You're uh, living proof. So many, so many arguments, you know, now that I, I just think back and I'm like, wow, what a... What a jerk I was being. Yeah, um, what a gift. Yeah. Um, so so what age was that that you switched to banjo? I switched to banjo after I heard Bela Fleck when I was 14, and I okay. pretty much went cold turkey on the piano. Was that Fleck um, Tones? You know, the first record that I heard was Double Time, the duet the record. The Trishka? No, um, it's it's the oh, one that's like a yep. bunch of different duets with different people. Um, yeah, like O'Connor and Shad. Yeah, and, and, and Tony Hartford, Rice and Hartford. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. It's a cool record. Um, yeah, I used to like, uh, I almost failed geometry because I was, I would wear a hoodie in class and then like, you know, feed, Have my, your headphones feed my headphones up underneath the hoodie. And <laughs> how did you just, how did a 14 year old discover Bela Fleck duet? Yeah. Yeah. So my folks had a pretty big record collection that uh, my brother, my older brother, um, who's four and a half years older than me, kind of got into listening to. And he found the original, original David Grisman quintet mm-hmm. record. Um, and then I th- was telling one of his friend's dads about it. And that dad burned a bunch of records, okay. like burned a bunch of CDs for Quinn and I to listen to. And one of them was Double Time, yeah. which I, you know, now I know is a bad thing (laughs) 
listening oh, to, to burn yeah CD. listening to burn records but you know at the time i was just so psyched um i'm i'm sure that somehow or another bela fleck has gotten some of your dollars because of <laughs> him burning you that cd so totally yeah it ended up all right but um and then so i started on lessons uh in Seattle with a guy named Dave Keenan, okay. who is uh, kind of one of the fixtures of the acoustic scene out there. He, he plays, let's see, banjo, guitar, like electric and acoustic, mandolin and fiddle, and writes a lot. He also like edits classical scores for video game music. He's just like wow. a, a really great musician and was an awesome first teacher. Um, he's an interesting banjo player because he doesn't necessarily play Scrug style like note for note Mm -hmm. but he uh like his his version of the banjo is just so cool it's like so open and i think you know i kind of started out with that from the get-go with this idea that like it doesn't have to be this set in stone constrained yeah yeah yeah. and and you know that's kind of like i think such a great gift a teacher can give a student you know yeah is the is the open mind yeah so what did he actually did he that being said, was he still starting you off with the roll patterns? Yeah. And all of that oh, business? yeah. No, I mean, I got a really solid foundation in, in like, roll-based banjo playing, for mm-hmm. sure. It wasn't necessarily, like, note-for-note Scruggs style, you know? He's just not the kind of person, because he plays so many other instruments, too, and he kind of plays them all like himself. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, yeah, it, it, it was awesome. The more I think back on that, you know, I think I was just really lucky to have such... Excellent teachers. Still influencing you, probably. Yeah, the, the we're mindset. friends. We, we always hang out. You know, he comes and visits me in Nashville sometimes. Cool. So you were pretty consumed by it. You were, did you practice quite a bit in those days? A ton. Yes, yeah, so much. I mean, I, uh, probably three or four hours a day, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, every day. Uh, there was this poor neighbor <laughs> that I just probably, like, tortured, you know. On I, the island? On the island, yeah, at, at my mom's house, yeah, just playing along with records and stuff and you know i have a few college roommates who could start a support group for that poor neighbor of yours <laughs> yeah for sure totally but yeah i also um my my on my dad's side my dad's oldest brother fred is also a banjo player he was actually um he lived in the area he lived in oregon yeah he lived like in southern oregon he was the guitar player and tenor singer for this like folk revival band called the Brandywine Singers. Okay. That basically they were doing really, really well. And then the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan and their careers tanked like almost wow. overnight. But they oh were like gosh. selling out college auditoriums. You know, they were doing really, really well. Um, but Fred is a really great banjo player and bass player and guitar player and singer. So, uh, whenever um, you'd run into him, yeah, he would show me some stuff and yeah. So who were your other influences? Obviously you probably stuck with Bela a bit. Did you dive deep into the bluegrass guys? Eventually. Yeah. I mean, at first, you know, coming from not, not being steeped in the bluegrass world Mm -hmm. at all. I mean, the music that I really grew up listening to was like classical music and then like the Beatles James Taylor and Jackson Brown, you know, like that's what was where your parents were. Yeah, that's like what was playing around the house, you know. So like at first, especially bluegrass vocals was really jarring for me. I was just like, why are they singing like that? You know, but now I love it. I absolutely love it. But it took me a while. You know, I think you you have that that moment when you were at least for me when I realized like, wait, if I want to sound like. Bela or Gnome or Jens or any of the like really amazing modern banjo players, Tony Trishka, I have to be a really good Scruggs style player. You know, like the, those two things are, they are inseparable. Would you, would you tell people that these days, even if they are convinced that they never want to be in a bluegrass band? Yes. And they hate that music, but they just want to yeah. play like Trishka, you would still recommend that they Oh, certainly have that if they foundation. want to play like Trishka. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a bad I mean, example. Maybe more more Jens or uh, Yeah, or, or Gnome or Yeah, I mean it's I I think it, I think of it as like the classical technique of of three finger banjo. There's just something about like the tone production and timing aspect of it you just don't get anywhere else. Like you can't put your right hand through its paces any other way. Yeah, it's almost like the the grammar where any, mm. anything you're 
saying doesn't make as much sense if yeah. you if you don't have a, a grammar system right right that's that's tying it all together yeah i, I think d- of it as like it, things sound anemic yeah but. there's there's something not not there that should be mhm so what happened then when did you start playing with people when did you start developing your own style and what yeah. what kind of things did you do to i mean you explore know explore that uh i actually wrote a tune so, you know, the, the first tune I learned was Cripple Creek okay. from Dave. And I, I came back a week later having, like, you know, um, having it pretty well down, you know. I, I, it's like I'd played a lot of music, so practicing that for a week, I could, I could play it pretty well. It's no different the than your piano. Yeah, practice. well, I mean, it's like the mechanics of it were different, obviously, at, at first. But I think I just, like, I had the tools to understand how to practice well. That's important. Yeah. And so, like, I came back and I had learned Cripple Creek and, like, could play it fairly competently um, and had also written a tune. I, I wish I could remember what the <laughs> tune was, but I had written a tune. I think I was just so excited about the the freedom of the banjo coming from the classical world. Interesting. You know, where, like, I can just write a tune on this. Like, I can do whatever I want, you know? Like, it, it was so freeing. Were you aware of improvisation or was that something that you knew that I mean, yeah, was out but there? yeah, but I I didn't know how to improvise at all, mm-hmm. and it's funny because now, like, if all the I knew a little bit of music theory on on piano, but sure. like when I think music theory in my head, it's all banjo. It's not piano. I oh, think most people assume that like I, that you know if I'm thinking scales and chords and stuff, it's all piano in my head. It's totally not because like I learned to improvise on the banjo. So it's all banjo, for better or worse. I mean, the, it's all the same notes, right? Yeah. They're, they're still there. It still yeah, works. Yeah. So, so what was the next thing that happened? Somehow you, you ended up, did you, did you go to school out east? I know you ended up out in the Boston area. Right. Well, so the first thing that happened was that I met Simon Chrisman, who is this just like epic hammered dulcimer player. He like transcends that instrument. Um, and he's like six years older than me, so we never. He, but he grew up on Bainbridge Island. We oh no kidding. And so he was twenty when I was fourteen. Right. And I went and saw Bill Frizzell and Danny Barnes, that band, that mm-hmm. iteration of the Bill Frizzell band, play on Bainbridge. And Simon opened for them solo. Solo. Yeah, okay. just like solo on the dulcimer. Um, and then I ran into him at this place called the Veggie House, which is a, a vegetarian Vietnamese restaurant. And uh, and he gave me his business card, which is so funny now, thinking back on on Simon even having business cards. <laughs> it doesn't seem to fit no, his character. No, no. I mean, but uh, and then we got together and and like you know he was uh, way better than I was when when I first started. This is still playing. when you're fourteen. This 15. is when I was fourteen. I had yeah. been playing banjo for like six months or something, and mm-hmm. then I met Simon. You know, and and he like got together with me, and I think he was just psyched to like have somebody to play with. You know, who was a young person, and and so we kind of started playing more and more together. We would play like three or four days a week for an hour or two. Wow! Um, and kind of created this whole language together before we knew that 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 like five string banjo and hammered dulcimer was like a really weird thing. Yeah, you shouldn't shouldn't, shouldn't <laughs> that be able to should, do that. That we shouldn't. Yeah, totally. Um, and that continues to this day. We actually just released a duo record. I, I own that, and I was going to bring it up. Now would be a good time, I guess. That's, sure. that's some. It's it's really funny the way that you explain this because that's what I was going to say is that the the intricacies of some of the playing. I can't tell if it's improvised or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's I think part of the beauty of it is that these things seem to happen. Just little timing yeah. changes and and arrangements that seem. They seem perfect enough that they must be arranged, but if all of it was truly arranged, then it would have taken forever for you guys to actually figure all that out. Well, and the only explanation left is that you guys have spent so much time. We've spent so together. much time.
I think working up that kind of material with anyone else, almost anyone else, w- would have taken twice as long easily. But we just are, we kind of have this like mind meld thing going on. So yeah, it's, it's, I think there are, you know, just, just in the same way that like, I don't know, there's maybe just a, a handful of people like in, in romantic relationships that you, that you form like a, a really, really tight bond with in your life, you know, um, mm-hmm. or maybe just one person. I don't know. I think there's only a few of those people musically too. And, and Simon is, is definitely one of them. That's really interesting. Um, so just to put a bow on that, what's that? What's that new recording called? I can't remember. It's just self-titled. Okay. It's it's called Simon Chrisman and Wes Corbett. Okay. Yeah, and that yeah. just came out a, a week or two ago. We're, yeah. we're talking right now in early June. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure when people will be listening to this, but <laughs> sure. But it's out there, and it's a hammer dulcimer and banjo duet, and it's it's really fascinating stuff. So yeah, keep keep going. So who did you end up? Yeah, so, signing to play with. Well, so I, I I hung with Simon for a couple of years, and then went to Wintergrass, which was kind of my hometown festival. Which right. again, I'm super lucky because that's an amazing festival. Yep. I mean, like they their lineup is is really diverse. You know, like they would hire like killing trad bluegrass bands, and then a bunch of other things I'd never heard of. And there, when I was jamming, I met uh, Jake Jolliffe, Alex Hargraves. I think that's, well, I, you know what it was is that this band called Pupville was playing there mm-hmm. one year, which is sort of a, basically a kid's band that David Grisman put together for okay. his son Sam to play bass in. Um, and that was Sam, Sam Grisman, uh, Jake Jolliffe, Frankie Nagel, who was a really amazing banjo player and singer. I haven't really heard from her in a long time. Okay. Alex Hargraves on fiddle and this guy named Ian Fleming from Montana on okay. guitar, um, who is a engineer somewhere now. But a but, bunch of hot shots. Yeah, everybody was so good. Yeah. And, and I met all those guys, and um, I was a little older than them. I was like a few years, like I'm two years older than Jake. And, but I kind of you know, kicked around with them that winter grass and, and jammed a bunch in one of the stairwells. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of kicked the whole thing off. You know? I mean, the, the bluegrass scene or acoustic scene, whatever you want to call it, is, is I think for every generation um, a pretty close-knit thing, you know, at least regionally. Because like, through them, I met like Sarah DeRose and Dominic Leslie and um, all kinds of other great pickers. Yeah, um, there's a there's a web. And yeah, and connect. and it all kind of came from going to festivals together when we were kids and and you know like our parents would just kind of let us do whatever. Yeah, that's amazing. Like my dad would just drop me off at Wintergrass. Yeah, that's almost <laughs> incredible to even think about at this point, but Right, right. Good good thing he did. Yeah. So, um and then I graduated from high school and um decided that I would try to go to college for banjo. I ended up going to Cal Arts in Valencia for a year as a banjo player, but they didn't have a banjo program. And it, it it's an amazing school, facilities, teachers, everything, but it it, it just felt like I kind of already knew what I wanted to be and mm-hmm. what, where I wanted to be. And that school, it was really expensive and like none of my old school, like none of my like high school picking buddies were anywhere near there. And kind so, of a lonely yeah, situation. Yeah, it kind of was a weird situation. So I ended up leaving and I moved home for like nine months and worked the only real job I've ever had, which was uh, working in a bakery. And then uh, saved up money, moved to Boston kind of on a whim, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, uh, I had met Chris Eldridge and Chris Pandolfi, and they tipped me off that they were moving to Nashville to start the String Dusters. And basically, so, like, I moved maybe a month after Pandolfi left Boston. Um, Having just graduated from Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, and he had been, like, you know, teaching and gigging a lot. So I, like, actually moved at 19, I think, with gigs on the books to Boston. Basically filling in for him. Yeah. Or, or not filling in, but picking Right, kind of just picking up, behind. yeah, like picking up the, you know, the hole in the, in the scene there that he had been filling, um, which is a really lucky thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was so funny, actually. I played some, like, what was it? So, some, like, private party the first week that I moved there. 
<laughs> and it was like out on the Cape and it was like there's lobster everywhere and like some super expensive wow. private party. And and we each got paid like seven or eight hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was like, I just I just need to get like one or two of these a month and I'll be set. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, um, I didn't, you know, of course, didn't get one another gig like that for like two years. (laughs) Take them when you can. (laughs) Right. But yeah. Um, So and uh, at that point, I had met Tristan and Tashina Claridge. Okay. um, And we had started this band called the Bee Eaters Mm -hmm. with Simon. And it's essentially. How did Simon get out there, too? Um, the whole band moved out to Boston eventually. Kind of the, the scene was exploding because Berkeley had started allowing banjo and mandolin players to come, and NEC had started accepting some people too. Um, Sarah Jarrows went to NEC. Uh, let's see who else. Um, I, I mean, a bunch of other people. Yeah, no, but like at, Bridget at Carney. Point, um, yeah, b- basically, like there's just a whole flock of acoustic yeah. players. Right. And and so it, it sort of came to this apex um, where it was like almost every single music friend I'd ever made was living in Boston, which was an, an incredible thing. And during that time, this band called the Bee Eaters was rehearsing like crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, we had made one record that we had rehearsed for qu- quite a bit um, that Daryl Anger produced and engineered. Yeah. And that one's just self-titled. Okay. Uh, they might be a little hard to find, these records. But And then um, another one uh, th- that was the last thing I did with the band in 2010 called Odd Fellows Road that I, I'm still to this day like really proud of. Um, which that, that was the first time I met this really amazing engineer named Dave Cinco, too. He, okay. he engineered that record. Yeah, um, and he, of course, is... Why don't, why don't you give his brief <laughs> credentials? Sure. I mean, yeah, so he has been in the audio engineering world since the, like, late 80s, early 90s. He cut his teeth uh, working pop country okay. stuff um, in Nashville and, you know, kind of quickly rose to being one of, the, one of the people that the sort of greater bluegrass and acoustic scene realized that he, he, he just has this, like, sensitivity to what's going on musically and uh and from an engineering side that's kind of unparalleled like working with him is like having another band member wow and he actually engineered the the record uh that simon and i just made too okay um and mixed it and mastered it yeah (laughs) um and i've had the the luck of uh producing a couple records and and uh the latest one with front country uh we mixed that record together Okay. Um, That's an incredible record, too. Oh, thanks. I remember um, Jeremy Darrow, the the bass player for Front Country, I think it was at Midwest Banjo Camp a couple years ago, Mm. was coming to me just beaming about this new recording that they were making and had really great things to to say about you. It seemed like you made a a big difference for them. That was such a fun session. I mean, it was um, 10 days in a really beautiful studio in Oakland and, um, you know, kind of like all the all the gear you could ever want or need. Was that um, your first stab at producing? Yeah, producing a record start to finish. And, okay. uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess the, the thing that's sort of complicated about it is, like, I had been really involved in, in Bee Eaters records, you know, in terms of, like, arranging things. I'm not saying I, I arranged everything myself, but, like, I wrote a lot of that material and, like, we arranged it all as a band. So, like, I've... I've been a lot more than just like a a gun for hire mm-hmm. in my tip like in my typical career, you yeah. know. Um, so it was a natural thing to happen. Yeah, yeah, and like the last. I mean, we haven't even talked about Joy Kill Sorrow yet. I guess um, yeah. the the last record that we made with Joy Kill Sorrow uh, was self produced, and I think it's by far our best. Okay, um, you know, and and I really started to pay attention to like signal chains on things and and how things are you know how it's all going in and and like what's affecting people's performances and i I really started to pay attention to that during that session so what um if if you have a way of encapsulating that in any effective way so let's take the front country project what were the types of things that you contributed to that that you think made it a successful project well i mean you know uh, for one thing it's like i i just try to pick 
musicians that I think are really great yeah. <laughs> to work with. That does but um, but I had some arrangement ideas on some things. Maybe not like uh, on some things that they sent me, some demos they sent me, it was basically like, cool, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and then some things that I kind of helped them deconstruct and put back together. And I think that for me, working with different producers, you know, over, over the course of my career so far, the thing that's really stuck with me um, – pros and cons of, of somebody as a producer that I like working with is somebody who doesn't talk if they don't have something to say. They're, they're not trying to feel like they're earning, they need to earn their yeah, paycheck. Well they're, yeah, by... or, like they're, they're, or that they're bringing their ego into putting their sort of sound stamp on a record at the cost of, of where the music maybe should actually go. Okay. Um, and, and so for me, it was kind of just like, you know what? I, I just want to help people make records that sound good. Uh-huh. Like I want people, I want to help people get along. I want to help tones happen in a, in like a really great way. Um, we spent a whole day on tones with front country, the whole first wow. day. Um, and you know, honestly, I think that in the, in the acoustic world, at least, that's a, a, the the best possible use of your time in the studio, because like if you walk into the control room and are listening back to something, and the stereo image is already functioning, right? As in like there aren't conflicts between instruments that don't exist acoustically. Yeah, you're in a really good place. Yeah. Whereas if you're like, oh, we'll fix it in mix. That, I hate that. I hate, I that, hate that staying. Because, like, all you're doing is causing problems that you're just going to be diving down the endless digital rabbit hole through mixing and mastering. Mm-hmm. Just, like, get it right from get the get-go. Right. Yep. And, like, not only will playback in, in the control room sound better, but everybody's headphones sound amazing. Yeah. You know? Like, which means that people make... More inspiring to listen to. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a cumulative... It's effect. a very cyclical thing. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think that's a huge, a huge portion of it is, like, trying to factor my own ego out of it as much as possible. And, yeah, staying out of the way. Unless, like, unless you need to be there. <laughs> yeah, being as objective as possible and, yeah. and honest at the same time. Sure. So we haven't actually talked a whole lot about your actual playing. Sure. What, what types of things did you work on that, I mean, by the time you're working on the beat eaters and everything, you, you were pretty established in terms of, of how you play. Yeah. And um, what types of things did you work on to, to get there? What, what did you consider your influences? And Sure. I mean, I listened to a ton of Bela and definitely a lot of, like, young gnome. And then it also kind of started working my way backwards towards trad banjo playing by that yeah. point. You know, and I think that, that the, like, classical piano thing can't – that influence can't really – be undone (laughs) so there's so much of the bee eaters music that that's almost like chamber music really Mm -hmm. that you know is very the way i'm playing banjo is very piano-y honestly but in terms of like how i got there i mean i was trying to figure out ways both kind of quarterly and scalarly to map the instrument um, because there really weren't resources for that yet. I mean, there still aren't a whole lot of them, so but there's way more now than there than there were when I was 21. Yeah. Um, just in terms of like understanding how to navigate the fingerboard in a bunch of different keys and like uh, play passages uh, like melodic passages that that scale, you know, almost two octaves or something like uh, that mm-hmm. you can't use open strings to do (laughs) yeah you know i mean and it was all stuff that i was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants like i guess i'll do it like this you know and it's a funny thing because there's just there's no established pedagogy for any of it which is so different than like you know violin or piano that has hundreds of years of people being like you know what works this (laughs) yeah uh so i and i think the banjo i hope will will get there but it's a it's it's a complicated thing because the instrument is is just so much less linear as well. It's really good at being a banjo and pretty bad at 
other things. Yeah, the the strings are at weird intervals. Right. And I think the range of the whole thing is, is fairly compact compared to most right. other instruments. And right. Yeah, it's Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that asymmetry is sort of what makes it so cool at the same time. Right, you, you're hearing the limitations, and that's the, the character of it. Right. So what is this banjo that you're playing? This is a really cool-looking instrument. Um, I am playing a Hawthorne Top Tension, which is basically a, a copy of an RB7. Right. Um, it has so a, is this a maple Yeah, it's instrument? all maple. It um, has like a you know tiny bit of a radius on it. I forget what actual... I, I, okay. we're, we're getting real banjo nerdy here, but... Uh, and then... Let's see. Uh, it has a Huber ring. I, for, I actually forget what kind of rim it has in it. <laughs> what, a Remo head? Uh, I've been digging the Deering Smile bridge okay. on, on this banjo. Um, it, it definitely opened some stuff up. Uh, you noticed a difference with that? I did. I did. So if you, so you have a, well, you said a Huber ring and some sort of rim. What, who is Hawthorne? Is he just the one who made the neck? And you, did you piece this thing together? No, they made this instrument for me. Um, they're the only folks who are manufacturing top tension parts in the States right now. Wow. Um, and yeah, so they, they make really great stuff. Um, yeah, I've, I've had this for maybe a little over a year now, and I've played it like pretty much exclusively since. Okay. There's something really special uh, that top tensions can do in terms of uh, sustain, I think is really what it, it – I mean, it's like there's a tonal difference too. Like more a, sustain, you think? Yeah, more sustain um, and typically like more of kind of like a pop in the mid and low end of, of what banjos produce, like, um, I, you know, uh, from a frequency response – yeah, uh, spectrum where we're talking like one and two hundred okay. is is sort of behind every single note you play. Yep. it's kind of like if you you know like uh, like that sound like if you hit your your fist into your hand. It's amazing that you say that because I always described it as being the knock. Mm-hmm. I, I look for the knock. You want to? It's it's the frequency that taps your chest when the back of the resonator. <laughs> yeah, is, um, totally is is leaning against your body. Sure, um, sure. And that's a good sign when it has that. Yeah. What are your other uh, like live preferences? It seems like you're you're into microphones and things, and so am I. So talk about what you yeah. use and what you do for a live setup. Yeah. So I mean, in the last couple of years, um, I guess we kind of skipped over playing with Joy Kilsar. I played with this band yeah, called Joy Kilsar, we, and we yeah. toured a lot. I toured. Right. You know, that's the some of the most touring I ever did, and uh, toured internationally. We played on Prairie Home Companion, released three records that I was on. Um, and that was a band with, uh, with the aforementioned Jake. Yeah, Jake Jolliffe, Bridget Carney, um, who's the bass player for Lake Street Dive, uh, Emma Beaton, and Matt Arcara, who is a, a Winfield champion. Yeah. Um, and Emma is an amazing singer. Um, yeah, so I toured with that band a lot. And that, that's like, I kind of like satiated my like classical banjo tooth with the bee eaters and then i've also like always loved pop music and joy kilsar was very pop influenced yeah and then in the last like three years i've been playing with molly tuttle yeah um which has been super fun and uh this banjo really opened up some cool stuff playing with molly because there's there's some sort of like you know i don't know um allison krauss and union station type material like slower stuff yeah. in particular that like a lot of other bands would probably have somebody play dobro or or you know something with more sustain like yeah. or just have me play guitar um but molly's always let me just play banjo and you know um i think one thing that people like about playing with me is that i'm maybe a little more i don't know sensitive to what's going on like in a in a in a global ensemble sense yeah. than, than some other players. So like playing really, really quiet, slow material is actually kind of my favorite thing to do on the wow. banjo. Interesting. Um, so getting to do that with Molly has been so fun. And, and this and banjo the sustain. Comes yeah. In. It's so nice. Like you can, you, on this banjo and Tom tensions kind of in general, like you can move your right hand, like all the way up to basically to the neck mm-hmm. and, and it won't like, wimp out it'll just get fatter wow what other gear do you use oh right yeah we were talking about sorry that's okay (laughs) um so with molly i've been playing through a 214c 
yeah. uh, which is the sort of cheaper version of a 414. 414. It doesn't have any pattern selection. Um, and I really like that microphone. Yeah. Um, I think for whatever reason, like for my right hand, you know, like for my voice, it does what I really want a microphone to do. And amazingly enough, it's a large diaphragm microphone. It's never fed back. Well, I was just going to yeah. ask if that actually works for most situations. It's never fed. Like guitar, like Molly's guitar mic is is going to feed back like ten times faster than than this will. Wow. It's an interesting. I mean, I think it's a it's a combination of that uh, it's trans what transducerless, so it it it's super high output, and uh, and then. It'd be transformerless. Yeah, I think sorry, is what sorry, you're yeah. yeah, sorry. It's been. I've already been teaching <laughs> <laughs> transformerless. So it's super high output. So it's really easy for sound guys to just crank it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it is way tighter, at least uh, to my to my experience, than a typical large diaphragm would be. Which mostly those can usually pick up an entire stage of people. Totally. Yeah, but um, this this is like feels like it's less than 90. Okay. Um, and so, and like uh, monitors are typically pretty quiet on stage with mm-hmm. Molly too, um, which is helpful. I mean, I'm sure if I was like playing with a really loud band, it, it would be a nightmare. Or drums or something. Yeah, like yeah. But um, it's been amazing. Yeah, it's great. It, it has a, a really nice proximity boost when you get like really close. So playing the the slow stuff that I was talking about, like if you get, you know, if you put the banjo like what, I don't know, like An two, inch or something. two inches yeah. from the diaphragm or it, it, it's like the whole, it just gets huge. Yeah. That yeah. would make sense from a, from a ultra geeky standpoint, the more directional a microphone is, the more pronounced that proximity effect to be so the mm. fact that you think it's more focused actually makes sense with the fact that yeah yeah that it does cool accentuate those uh lower frequencies yeah yeah and yeah. we just lost everybody <laughs> <laughs> i've also um proximity effect y'all look it up <laughs> i also really like I've, with shows with simon um i've been using what is it auto audio technica pro 35 clip on mic yeah and I had been running it through a headway preamp, which I've had for a long time, which is uh, this English preamp company. Okay. Um, but it, it finally died on me, and I'm actually oh. pre, like, live preamp less right now. I'm, I'm going to get a Felix sometime soon. Yep. I mean, that's sort of become the industry standard. Um, I don't quite need one right now. You know, like, uh, so I've just been running the, that clip-on mic straight to the house and... Um, they're pretty amazing. I mean, they typically uh, we just leave it flat, mm-hmm. and that and that works. Yeah, and you don't miss anything by not being able to not with adjust Simon. your dynamics in and out of the. It wouldn't work with Molly, but with Simon, I mean, we are so like if you put uh, just one microphone in front of us, it's pretty balanced. Like I, we've worked really hard on on keeping the dynamics focused. How to blend and stay out of yeah. each other's way. And, yeah, yeah. So, like, um, it works just fine. And Simon, I mean, is, like, one of the most... Um, you know what I really think of it? it? He's, like, one of the most generous musicians I've ever met in terms of, like, when you're playing with him, uh, it he just makes you sound better, you know? So, like, playing with a microphone where, like, I can't step into something and get louder or step away and get softer... Um, playing with him, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. He's, not he, he's, he's just listening, you know. He's, and it sounds like you try to approach it the same way, too. For sure. For yeah, sure. That's, that's a good combination. Yeah. Um, we haven't actually talked too much about actual playing. How, so for anyone unfamiliar with your playing style, do you have a way that you characterize it? I mean, to me, it's, it's, very, it's a very fluid mix of all of, all of our standard Right. Styles that we know about, the Scruggs, the Melodics, the... Yeah. Uh, the single strings. I mean, I think I have just been conscious of wanting to take all of those different ways of, of thinking about the banjo and, and just turning it into one voice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, most recently, a lot of that has just been from, like, learning fiddle tunes, actually, you know, and, and learning them in both octaves. Um, okay. And, like doing them almost always in like blended single string and melodic style. Um, Is that what you find yourself practicing? 
most often? I mean, what I find myself practicing most often is the material that I have to learn. Whatever the next <laughs> yeah. day's gig To be totally requires. honest. Yeah, I mean, people, you know, like students ask me that, and I, I always struggle with, like, do I give them the honest answer or do I give them the, the you know, because, like, the reality is, like, I am on tour a lot, and then, like, I am typically doing other other stuff when I'm not playing with Molly or Simon. You know, if I'm home in Nashville, be doing a recording session or, or playing a gig and get the station in. And so I'm, like, constantly learning material. And you play with a lot of, yeah, different combinations of people. Right, which right. Always complicate. It's, it's great, but it complicates things in, in another way. Totally. But if, if I'm going to, yeah, if I'm going to sit down and, and practice, I'll, I'll probably warm up with the metronome for a little while, sometimes just my right hand, like especially sort of evening out rhythmic disparities between s- switching between uh, single string and roll bass stuff. So how do you actually practice that? You'll, you'll play a roll and then go what, right into a, yeah. a single string? Yeah, pattern? yeah, just like keep the eighth notes going and make sure it's all really locked into the grid. Interesting. And then, uh, you know, I might play some scales. <laughs> I wish I had like a, I'm like, I've never been one of those players that has like a, I like, you know, I do this for 15 minutes and this for 15 minutes. I've like never been that organized in any aspect of my life, um, except when someone's paying me to produce a record. <laughs> but when it counts. Yeah. But like, yeah, uh, you know, um, and then learning something new is almost always the best catalyst for me to like get excited about the instrument, learning a new tune or like transcribing a solo. Even if it, even if I only make it through like a lot of the time, I only make it through like half the solo or something. And then I'll just like get too excited about some new stuff that I've learned and I'll like figure out how to make it close position. And then like, you know, maybe cycle it through the circle of fourths or fifths. Uh, so I can play it, in, you know, in every key. Um, wow. So yeah, usually for me it's like these days when I'm practicing I'm I'm just looking for like things to steal <laughs> and then like and then you know incorporate into my own voice. Almost everyone I've talked to has said some version of that yeah. when, when talking about their own style about how it's just it's just a, a grab bag of little snippets that you've learned everywhere. Sure. And have smuggled into people's ears by playing it yourself yeah so maybe what you were just saying about um what did you just say you learned a fiddle tune and then you learn it in a close position and then you cycle it through the fourths and <laughs> then you learn it single string and yeah i mean i i usually uh it's more like a lick you know like taking a lick and and figuring out why it's functioning the way it is and then and then uh using it on banjo in a, in a bunch of different ways like and then you know some of that stuff can also be used compositionally too yeah yeah i mean let's see so like uh the first track of off the new record with simon actually you know what no let, let's I'll, I'll do this one called ostrich blues okay um that's super like thematic kind of so i, I this tune just kind of poured out of the banjo after i had spent an afternoon playing along with um molly and balafon players on youtube Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I actually played in between. I, What's I guess, a bal- balafon? Tell- it's like it's a it's like a West African marimba, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like wood keys that yep. you hit with mallets. Gotcha. Um, and uh, I just have always really loved West African music. I actually sort of accidentally worked my way to the banjo, uh, sort of tertiarily through uh, learning West African percussion and then also some kora. In between, you like, play some Cora. I don't anymore. Wow. I have one. I built one. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> How do you build a Cora? Uh, so the the guy that ended up being my teacher, this guy named Jeff Bodoni, um, is actually like one of the best Cora builders in the world. Tumani Diabate plays one of his Coras. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> so uh, as a as a senior project, I convinced my school to let me uh, build a Cora with Jeff. So you so you did it and you still own it and you I actually do. know some. Uh, I, it's been so long, um, but I, you know, I, I that's definitely in there in my playing. Like wow. it, like that, you know, that approach to rhythm is is in there. Not I'm not saying I'm like super deep on on trad Malian music, but um, you know, I spent a few years studying it and was really excited about it. Have you ever transcribed any of that to banjo, or do you use any of? It, I mean, the chorus stuff is like sort of impossible because the chorus stuff is so much about 
having like a walking bass line mm-hmm. and then a mid range line and then improvising on top of that. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's kind of just not. It's like I, I guess it's just, it's so frustrating on the banjo to try to do that that um, it, I it, haven't really. At least those melody lines, at times, seem possible. I, yeah, I don't. Oh, the melody lines do. Yeah, I think it's like. But for me, I wish that it's like if I'm going to play that, I would want to just play it on Cora. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like those sorts of things like soak into your playing, whether or not you're consciously adapting them to banjo or not. I agree. They're in there. It, so like, it, you know. And if they're in there, they'll come out. Right. Come like, out. you know, like I would 100% say like if, if there's a workshop happening on like a trad Malian percussion or something where you live, like go to it. And okay. don't worry about like trying to do it on the banjo. Just go to it and mm-hmm. like have fun playing those instruments and like try to understand what's happening. And I guarantee it will like open something new on the banjo whether or not you're being super purposeful about it or not yeah. so um, for you it opened up ostrich blues ostrich is that, is that blues what yeah that's what it's called and simon takes this like just killing solo on this but um so this yeah. is on the new record this is on the new record okay yeah That's really cool. I have a secret lifelong dream, or I guess not even so secret, but I have a lifelong <laughs> fantasy of playing banjo in like a, an Afro pop band. So oh, yeah, anything rad. that has those influences is, it, it gets me <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So too. everyone should have enjoyed that. If you want to hear the ripping hammer dulcimer solo, <laughs> unfortunately so we don't have Simon here, but you'll, you'll have to go check out the, the new recording. And I was actually listening to it on the way here. Oh, nice. And it, yeah, it's really cool. Definitely unlike anything I've uh, I've heard. So any any banjo fans, this is something new to listen to. How do people find out about you online? Yeah, so I mean, I have a website. It's wescorbett.com. Um, I also teach online and in person. Mm-hmm. Um, all the all the info you need for that is on the website. Wescorbett.com. Yep. And they can find the the Hammer Dulcimer album there. Yes, they can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or all the usual places too, you know, um, iTunes. Yeah. Apple Music. The, the music places. Yeah, the music places. <laughs> Google yeah. knows. Yeah. It can tell you. Okay. Hey, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time, Wes. Of course. It's been a pleasure you. talking to you. Yeah, thanks for Good having Good luck me. for the rest of the weekend. Thanks, man. And that's all for this episode, folks. Thanks for listening to the conversation with Wes Corbett. You can email the show at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com 
Support the show at patreon.com slash banjo podcast, or just by subscribing and rating and telling all your friends about it. That all helps a ton. And I really thank you for that. So this is Keith Billick over and out. See you next time. Bye.